Thank you. I would like to welcome you to the regular uh, meeting of the Governing Board. Today is May, uh, I'm sorry, March 27th, 2024. And um, Ms. King, could you please uh, do our roll call? Juan Lawson. Here. Kathy Cavano. Here. Jason Olive. Here. Noel Ward. Here. Kurt Moore. Here. Thank you. Would you all please uh, rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and please stay standing uh, for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. We'll start with a little bit of routine business. Um, our first is to approve the minutes of the February 28th, 2024 regular board meeting. Could I please get a motion? Madam President, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the February 28th, 2024 regular board meeting. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor of approving the minutes of the February 28th board meeting, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have to approve and ratify our payroll and accounts payable vouchers. May I please get a motion? Uh, Madam President, I would like to make a motion to approve and ratify payroll and accounts payable vouchers. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Mr. Narducci, is there any correspondence for us? Madam President, members of the board, there is no correspondence at this time. Thank you. Our next um, part of the agenda is our Winter Sports Athletics Championships. This is our recognition set, uh, recognition uh, portion of the meeting. Uh, Ms. Ingersoll. Thank you, Madam President. This evening, we would like to recognize Perry basketball and Perry soccer. Both teams are state champions this year. We will start with soccer. The team is coached by Jason Berg. The team will come in. We have two players from the team this evening. Coach will say a few words, and Superintendent Narducci will join for a photo. Coach? Good evening, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so, you guys hear me, yeah? Um, so, uh, we have Tyler Heron and Caden Dossman up here. So, uh, Caden Dossman last year was uh, Gatorade Player of the Year for us as a junior, which is a big deal. He's a four-year starter. Tyler Heron, uh, first team All-State, um, first team All-Region, uh, did really well for us this year, two-year starter. Um, a lot of guys are at practice and work and whatnot so that they couldn't make it. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about the season. Um, after graduating 14 seniors last year, it was a rebuilding year with players having to find different roles to better the team. Um, no two years are the same, and this year's group had to find their identity and where they fit. Uh, the returning group was solid, but the new faces needed to step up. We had players who were three-year JV kids start and made an impact their senior year. Uh, the team ended with an 18-4-2 and four and two record, uh, winning the region and eventually the state. Uh, we had the Region Player of the Year in Senior Carson Pridey, Region Offensive Player of the Year in Senior Aiden Yen, three first-team All-Region players, Senior Tyler Heron, uh, Blake Rakook, and Caden Dossman, four second-team All-Region players, Freshman Jacoby Franklin, Junior Jameis Brown, Junior Brody Donovan, and Senior Olaf Jerzykowski. All-State honors for first-team went to Tyler Heron and Caden Dossman, and second-team All-State was Blake Rakook. Arizona All-State Player of the Year went to Carson Priday, a captain on the field and a great student off the field, boasting a 4.2 weighted GPA. The team traveled to California, volunteered in Chandler for community outreach, and had team dinners weekly. The experience they had will stay with them forever, and I am grateful to be a part of it. Uh, we appreciate all the support CUSD has given to athletics and making Chandler a destination district for future athletes. Thank you, and go Pumas. And Coach, if you could head up there for a photo. Coach, if we could get you up there too as well. <laughs> Thank you, soccer. Now we would like to recognize boys bas basketball coached by Sam Duane. The team will come in, coach will say a few words, and Superintendent Narducci will join for a photo. Coach, Coach Duane was just recognized by the NABC National Association of Basketball Coaches. 
This team has won the championship three years in a row, a three-peat for this basketball team. Player Koa Pete was also just named Gatorade Player of the Year for boys basketball. Koa also won Max Preps Player of the Year and AIA 6A Conference Player of the Year. Additionally, Para has had, Perry has had four boys Gatorade Players of the Year in a row, Koa twice, Dylan Anderson twice. Perry also had a girl Gatorade of the Year last year with Camille Pierre. Just some highlights on Perry basketball. Coach? Thank you very much. Thank you for having us tonight. Thank you to the board and uh, Mr. Or Dr. Narducci. Um, thank you for having us. Uh, this is a wonderful group. Um, third year in a row as state champions. Second year in a row as state open champions. Uh, Cole was Gatorade Player of the Year. DeAndre Harrison was 6A uh, first team all conference. Uh, Nono Brown was first team all region and first team all CUSD. Baron Silsby was CUSD and first team all, uh, and was uh, honorable mention all region. Our team was 24 and six this year. But I think above all of our accomplishments, today we had nine guys on the all academic team. They're outstanding students first. They're outstanding uh, contributors on campus. We traveled to Massachusetts and played in a, a national showcase. We played in one of the biggest Christmas events in Portland in the Les Schwab Invitational uh, against some of the best teams in America, high school teams. And coming out of those tournaments, the trainers, the staff, the people that ran the tournaments constantly came up to our coaching staff and said, what a wonderful group of young men that you have. They represented Perry High School in a tremendous fashion. They represented Chandler Unified in a tremendous fashion. I think that goes way, way uh, above the wins and losses, which I think being such high character kids has contributed to our wins. So we're very blessed to have them uh, in our school and very blessed to coach them. And thank you for having us. And coaches, if you could join. Coaches, if you could join for the photos, please. Thank you, players. Would the board please come down to the front for our next presentation? This evening, Chandler Unified would like to recognize the service and dedication of Chandler, the city of Chandler's former police chief, Sean Duggan. Many times, the city of Chandler will recognize outside entities for the difference they have made in the community, either directly or indirectly. Superintendent Narducci, his cabinet, the governing board would like to do the same for you, Chief Duggan. Please come to the front of the room, which you did. As the community may know, Sean retired this past January, concluding a 37-year in career in law enforcement. Duggan served as Chandler's police chief since January 2014, and before his retirement, was the most senior police chief among Valley cities. He served the city of Scottsdale for 27 years before leading the Chandler Police Department. Chief, Superintendent Narducci, and the governing board would like to present you with tokens of appreciation for your service and dedication to our schools and community. 
So first sheet, we have this wonderful recognition certification. You can put it on your refrigerator. <laughs> kindergarten artwork goes, and so we definitely want to have that for you. And then we also have a lifetime pass for you to any of our athletic events at any of our schools. And so we definitely appreciate you coming and supporting our teams. And to do that in fine fashion, I'm going to give you this, because you have to be able to dress to come to our <laughs> events. So we have for you taking care of our community and our kids for so long. A welcome home Channel Unified jacket that you can wear in the coldest of nights at football games or just coming to our events. So we appreciate all that you've done for us and, uh, and for our community. First, thank you for uh, this incredible recognition, Superintendent. Um, you know, one of the reasons why Chandler is one of the safest cities in our country is because of the deep rooted partnerships that we've uh, been able to forge over, over, over many, many years. And um, I can't think of a more important partnership than the one that we enjoy with our school district. Um, you know, it's said that policing isn't just the responsibility of police officers, but it's the community's responsibility. So I want to thank uh, Superintendent Narducci board members, incredible staff, and of course, all the amazing teachers uh, who are out there every day helping to keep our community safe. So thank you for this amazing recognition, and um, I just want to say that retirement is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just leave it with that. But thank you very much. The next portion of our meeting is one of the fun parts of it, and that is we get to hear from our students at our high schools. First up tonight from Hamilton High School is Brooklyn, Brooklyn Tallman. Good evening, Madam President, Superintendent Arducci, board members, and the entirety of CUSD. My name is Brooklyn Tallman, and I'm the student body president at Hamilton High School. I'm so honored to have the opportunity to present some of the great things that have happened within the Hamilton community during the winter. There have been some incredible events and accomplishments that I'm delighted to share with you all today. Starting off with our incredible athletic program and all of their successes. The head baseball coach, Mike Woods, was selected to the National High School Baseball Coaches Association Hall of Fame. He has continuously coached for Hamilton for 26 years. The program he built was made on high standards and accountability. Congratulations to Coach Woods. Girls soccer made it to the 6A state championship and finished as state runner-up. The team went 14-7-3 and seven and three throughout the season. We are so proud of our Lady Huskies. The tennis team participated in an invitational in Glendale. The players competed against 16 Arizona schools and took runner-up during the competition. Way to go, Huskies. Students Angela and Anna won fifth and sixth place at the Wrestling State Championship. We are so thrilled to see our wrestlers shine. Next up, I'm excited to discuss the academic accomplishments from the past few months at Hamilton. The speech and debate team competed in the state tournament at Mountain View High School. The highest placing Husky was Sahana, who placed fourth in impromptu speaking. A big congrats to the entire speech and debate team. The Molly Men team participated in a conference where they tied for third out of 26 schools involved. Many Huskies were given awards throughout the conference for their hard work. We are so proud of our Model UN students. 400 students across the state of Arizona participated in the annual We the People State Competition, and Hamilton secured the second place spot. They now have the opportunity to compete in Washington, D.C. Go Huskies! Our 4.0 ceremony took place this January to honor all of our hardworking Huskies for their outstanding grades. The class presidents at Hamilton introduced their peers and congratulated them on all they achieved. 
Liam McMaster enrolled in the AF JROTC program and acquired the J100 Character and Leadership Scholarship. Through this program, he was able to show his abilities and become a true leader. Congrats, Liam. Hamilton ROTC also visited the base fire department at Luke Air Force Base to learn and see hands-on experiences. This fantastic day created relationships for all the students. Keep working hard, Huskies. We have some outstanding talent over at Hamilton. Students Prisha Shroff and Alex Huang participated in the Innovation Fair and were crowned as Best of Fair winners. Wow. Prisha and her work were featured on the local 3TV news. Adding on, Prisha was also named Prudential Emerging Visionary for her inspiring commitment to improve the lives of others. She has been invited to New Jersey to enhance her innovation. Keep it up, Prisha. Lastly, we celebrated our 25th anniversary assembly this February. We had student-based games, teacher dances, performances, and even a special guest appearance by Fred Dupree, Hamilton's first ever principal. It was amazing to see our school history and how far we've come. That's everything we have happening over at Hamilton. Thank you for your time today and see you very soon. Thank you, Brooklyn. We appreciate hearing what's been going on at Hamilton. Next, um, from Perry High School, we have Austin Klaus. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Narducci. My name is Austin Klaus, and I am Perry High School Student Body President. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak in front of all you smiling faces and um, inform of you of all events at Perry High School. Uh, uh, since our last meeting together, uh, Perry had the opportunity uh, to put on a variety of uh, events. Um, first of those being our uh, annual talent show, Perry Idol. Students were able to showcase um, their talents in groups or by themselves. We had people performing Red Hot Chili Pepper songs, Mozart, um, Queen songs. It's a really good time, a really good chance for students to show their skills. Um, furthermore, near the end of our uh, third quarter, uh, we did our uh, uh, Spring Spirit Week. Um, we had students dress up for days like Western Day, Ski Day, Jersey Day. A lot of student participation. It was great. Uh, we also had our annual dodgeball tournament, one of my favorite events. Um, students were able to make their teams. They signed up during lunch. Um, they made their teams, went against each other to see who is truly uh, the best dodgeball team of all Perry High. Um, we had our uh, assembly that day after, too, where that dodgeball winner um, went against some staff uh, at Perry to see uh, the number one of all Perry campus. Um, during that assembly, too, we also announced our next dance, our prom, Perry Prom, uh, April 13th, 2024, Phantom of the Opera. Ooh. Uh, um, over this last quarter, Perry had the opportunity uh, to showcase our program with a few conferences. Uh, as some of you on the board may know, Perry um, hosted uh, the new revamped CUSD um, District um, Student Government Conference. Uh, all the um, high school student governments came together uh, to throw in a conference where we taught the elementary student governments, the middle school student governments, what high school Stugo is really about. Uh, we showed them how to paint posters. We showed them how to do fundraisers, do assemblies, all these events. We had games. It was a great time. I loved it. Um, Perry Stugo, we also had the chance to send some delegates up to the Arizona Association of Student Council Convention. Um, this convention takes high schoolers from all over the state. They um, show their ideas, get new info, share info. Really good chance to learn. Um, at that convention, they give awards um, out to each Stugo. Um, Perry Stugo won a few awards, including the top honors for Council of Distinction, the top honors for charitable contributions, as well as the top honors for service projects. Pretty good to me. Oh. Uh, um, and as some of you may have seen during the start of this board meeting, Perry has a great athletic program. Um, Barry, uh, Perry Boys Basketball won their third state championship, as you may know, two of them being the Open State Championship, the highest conference there is. Cole Pete was named the Arizona Gatorade Player of the Year, Max Preps, all 6A conference, and all Premier Region Player of the Year. And then our head coach, Sam Duane, was also named National Association of Basketball Coaches Outstanding High School Coach of the Year Award 
and all 6A and all Premier Region Coach of the Year. Girls basketball also had a really good run too this year. Um, they made their way to the 6A state championship game. They unfortunately didn't come out on top. Um, our runners up uh, this year. Still nevertheless, uh, great run this year. Great program, very good. Um, boys soccer made their way to the state finals uh, again where they won uh, the 6A conference. This is the second year in a row that they won, so I think we might have a dynasty on our hands. Let's see next year. Um, uh, and girls soccer made their way to the state quarterfinals this year as well, but weren't unfortunately uh, knocked out. Uh, we have Sydney Snowden, who was named the All 6A Defensive Player of the Year and the All Premier Region Offensive Player of the Year. Boys wrestling also made uh, their name known at the state tournament as well with uh, one of our wrestlers, Jaden Kimley. Uh, taking fourth in the 157 pound division. Girls wrestling also made their uh, name known as well with uh, two placers. Ariana Mouch making her way as the state runner up in the 165 pound division and Addison Palmer also taking third place in the 100 pound division. <clears throat> uh, we also have Perry Spirit Line um, making, finishing up all of their season for the year. Uh, Perry Palm Small Jazz was the open state championship. Show cheer and game day cheer were AIA Division I state runner-ups. Palm also got fifth place at state, and game day got fourth at nationals. Uh -uh. Now, with winter sports unfortunately coming to a close, we do have our spring sports. Don't worry. Uh -uh. Perry Baseball just started their season. Uh, they have a 5-4 record so far, doing pretty good. Uh, Perry Softball has also started their season, 7-10 a record. Beach Volleyball is currently 2-3 in their season so far. And boys volleyball coming off of their um, state championship win last year are 10 and three. Uh, we also have um, our track and field team who just recently had a meet. We have a new school record uh, in the javelin, Hayden Moon throwing 169 feet and nine inches. Uh, um, now, as we close my little presentation here, I have a few more uh, Perry Braggs uh, to just show off our school and some of the accomplishments students have made over this past quarter. Recently, Perry Decca traveled to New York City for a competition where Perry uh, High was awarded the Advocacy Award for Program Promotion. Perry Decca is only one of three chapters in Arizona to receive um, this award. Um, over break two, uh, for our culinary program, we have seniors Vinnie Santos and Niley Jackson, who represented Perry in the CCAP competition. And just for qualifying for the event, they are receiving a cash scholarship. Uh, we also have junior Charlie Tugatti, who made a recipe uh, that is actually going to be featured in CUSD High School cafeterias from May 6th to the 10th. Um, in our science research program, we also have some awards there. Um, uh, Maddox Turner won first place in the topic of chemistry. Catherine Carson won first in engineering mechanics. Charlie Waldron won first in Embedded Systems. Mikey Swart received second place in Material Science. Jet Timmons received fourth place in Energy, Sustainable Materials, and Design. Lawrence Santiago received fourth in Material Sciences. And Kira Lautenberger received fourth in Earth and Environmental Sciences. Uh, furthermore, we have Jackson Fleck, Ian Zeger, Luke Gormelin, and Kaden Zatar, who um, have two student films that were selected as finalists into the Phoenix Film Festival. If any of you are curious, um, you're going to be able to watch their films on April 13th at the festival, which will be in the Arizona student film category. Uh, um, Perry Dance also re recently received their highest honors for their program at the AZ High School Dance Festival. The dance uh, performed there was choreographed by Perry students who are in our Moveo dance program. Finally, Perry's Math Club took first for the second year in the row at the SCC Science and Math Field Day this past January. Um, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. And I can't wait to see you all again in May. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. We appreciate you updating us on what's going on at Perry. All right. Um, I think next, um, Mr. Narducci is going to introduce some new administrators. Before I do that, let's give him another round of applause. Our, our student leaders are fantastic. <laughs> they do so much for their cultures at their schools. They're there 
uh, for kids. They, they lead leadership activities for our junior highs and our elementaries. You guys are amazing, and thank you very much. We appreciate you being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. And your parents, too. <laughs> Madam President. Madam President, members of the board, as you're aware, um, Dr. Wendy Nance, who is sitting right over here to my left, will be retiring at the end of this year, the school year, after serving 19 years as principal, director, assistant, and associate superintendent in COSD with a career before that in Gilbert. And we'll get to that in June because we're not going to say goodbye to her yet. But we do want to welcome and say hello uh, to Chris Rosini, who will be our new assistant superintendent of U Human Resources. Uh, Chris um, has 20 years of human resources experience with 15 years dedicated to holding leadership roles within educational institutions. Chris brings a wealth of experience in leading all aspects of HR departments in both public and private sectors. He possesses a unique combination of leadership qualities that set him apart. He is innovative, forward thinking, and always seeking new and improved approaches to address challenges. Chris holds a master's degree in the organizational management and is currently the director of human resources for Mesa Public Schools, where he directly supervises over 5,000 employees. Chris, you're pretty close because we have about 5,200, so I think we got a good <laughs> match on that. Chris has also demonstrated exemplary leadership and commitment as the current president of the Arizona School Personnel Administrators Association. In his role, Chris has shown his unwavering dedication to advancing the field of human resources and public education across the state of Arizona. When Chris is not working, as you can imagine, um, he finds uh, immense joy in dedicating quality time to his family, fostering strong bonds and creating memories together. And I don't know when a, resource, a human resource person ever has spare time to do that, but I'm glad you have your family here. We want to welcome Chris. Chris, if you wouldn't mind going to the podium there, and uh, um, we want to welcome you, and congratulations on joining the Chandler family. So congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Narducci, and uh, Madam President, Governing Board members, uh, Superintendency, and Mr. Narducci. I just want to express my gratitude and my excitement for joining your team. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. I've really enjoyed where I've been, but I'm really looking forward to where I'm going. Can't wait to get it started, so thank you. And I did bring my family tonight, and uh, I won't bring them to every board meeting, but I will bring them often. <laughs> You're so, always welcome if there's seats. <laughs> my, the first one there is Ryan. He's uh, 10 ASU Aerospace Engineering. And then Hannah, she's at Gilbert, I mean, sorry, Halland High School. She's a sophomore right now. And then uh, Kelsey, she, is, uh, she attended actually Sumway Elementary for a long period of time. And of course, my better half here is April. So thank you guys. I'm looking forward to joining the team. Well, family, uh, <laughs> we have a profession in Chandler, Chris. Welcome home. So welcome home. And we're glad you finally selected the district of choice. And um, <laughs> Hannah, I just want to compliment you on making that shift there and giving your mom your seat and you moved. Um, that was really good. Nice job. <laughs> so uh, we appreciate all of you guys being here. And uh, we promise uh, to share your father with you, OK? Definitely. <laughs> All right, Chris, welcome, and we look forward to um, you attending more meetings here, coming up here, and I know uh, Dr. Nance and her team are, are working on a nice transition plan for you, so yep. welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, you guys. Have a good night. Thank you. I'd, I'd next like to introduce uh, Craig Luschner, who, who will be our new assistant principal and athletics director at Castile High School. Craig has been in education for 18 years with his teaching and coaching experience at McClintock High School, Williams Field High School, and Perry High School, and administrative experience at Saguaro High School and East Mark High School. It's a lot of places. Craig uh, resides in COSD with his uh, wife, Alexandra, son Jake, and daughter Macy, who are here with us tonight. He is also thrilled to be back where his children have been since they started attending school. Craig would like to express his gratitude to the current and past staff at CTA Freedom for truly showing love for his children. Macy, in fact, has shared she wants to be a third grade teacher. Is that true, Macy? Would you like to be a third grade teacher? Because we're going to get your contract right now. We're going to get your contract right now. All right. With an opportunity to lead Castile Athletics, Craig is hopeful to build upon an established culture of excellence and serve the community with passion. Craig would like to thank some of his past mentors 
uh, who are here in Chandler Unified School District and one that's not, but Dan Serrano and Marcus Williams, and recognizes there are great leaders to learn from here in Chandler. So, Craig, welcome to Chandler, and if you wouldn't mind taking one of the podiums there and introduce your family and say a few words for our board. Let's welcome Craig to the family. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Narducci and Cabinet. I usually don't write speeches, but I feel compelled to do well for the sharp-dressed man and the pretty girl sitting <laughs> next to him. So those are products of Abby Druck and CTA Freedom. Um, couldn't be prouder. Um, I'm happy to be home with my family. I thank you for the opportunity. Um, I did have one year under Dan Serrano at Perry, uh, probably the greatest learning experience in one year of teaching that I was able to have catapulted me over to Saguaro, where I was able to begin my administrative career. Uh, can't forget about my time on a committee with Mr. Wirth and Mrs. Berry. They might not even know I was on that committee, but I learned what an NP5000 was <laughs> and how much money parking lots uh, cost. So I'm now fiscally responsible from that time as well. Uh, a long time ago, about a decade ago, I interviewed for the dean position uh, at Castile High School and was fortunate enough not to have gotten it at the time because it gave me an, uh, 10 years of opportunity to learn, to come back to a great community uh, with more experience in the position and the desire and my passion, which is athletics. I lead through relationships, communication, and always follow up. Um, and I look to hope to uh, be elite and carry the vision of Dr. Castile, the namesake of the school, uh, Mrs. Lundberg, uh, the late Lund Ms. Lundberg, Mr. Phillips, and uh, I was trying to find a way to tie in Castile to the end of this. I hope to be your white buffalo, and I hope to lead the community with grace and love and passion, and I thank everybody for uh, everything that you were uh, going to teach me for the next 21 years of my career. Great. Thank you. You know, um, Craig, that 21 years could be binding. We'll just have to replay this tape, okay? So uh, it's almost like a contract there, but welcome. <laughs> well, welcome, and the kids, I don't have to welcome you back. This has been your district ever, ever since you started going to school. So, uh, again, welcome back to the family, and uh, we're, we're happy to have you here, and I know Castile is, uh, is looking forward to that. So, congratulations. Pete is my next person I'd like to talk about. Pete Mortson uh, is not new to COSD, but is a new administrator, so we'd like to introduce him to the community and to the board. Pete is our Support Services Assistant Director. Uh, Pete, is our, um, Pete was born in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. He moved to Arizona in 1995. In Tucson, he found his passion for precision woodworking. He's a woodworking expert. Uh, Pete joined COSD in October of 2011 as groundskeeper. He, has, he was promoted to general maintenance in the fall of 2012. And Pete says he has enjoyed working to improve grounds and facility maintenance throughout the district and is grateful to have the opportunity to continue that work in support of education. And what people don't understand is how our students and our families find our schools and the environments that they learn in and grow in are just as important as the teacher that's in front of them. And our crews do a fantastic job of making sure that that environment is safe, that it's clean, and it's productive. And there's so much that goes into that. I don't think you can pass one of our schools uh, and say, wow, uh, I go to old districts that I was in before, and I some aren't in this town. Um, and I, I marvel at the fact that how we have kept buildings and grounds uh, at their best condition until we have to replace them. And so, Pete, welcome to this position. And if there's a few things you'd like to say at the podium, you might go to that podium there. Um, and again, welcome back to your new position that you had yesterday and you will maintain today. I just wanted to thank the board for everything they do. Mr. Narducci, all the hardworking people here at district office. Um, I want to especially thank Tom Dunn and J.D. Finney for giving me the opportunity to help them um, in support of education and uh, the facilities throughout the district. So, well, Pete, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> and Pete, we're so happy that you get to round off that, that opportunity for our leadership. You do an amazing work, and so we appreciate you very much. Um, so those are my new administrator introductions. Back to you, Stephanie. Superintendent Narducci, Governing Board members, Madam President, um, we are going to have a presentation from Light the World Giving Machines. Um, before I do that, I want to pull up a, a couple photos so that this can go along with the presentation. 
So just give me one moment. Okay. So Light the World Giving Machines began in 2016 as a unique interactive way for the community to give back directly to those in need. Sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, machines are placed in locations throughout the U.S., and 100% of the funds collected go directly to supporting the chosen featured nonprofits. During the 2023 holiday season, CUSD's own Chandler Care Center was selected to be featured in the Gilbert Giving Machines. The director of the Care Center, Katie Kale, is here to share about the impact. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, Governing Board Members, Superintendent Narducci. Um, thank you so much, Stephanie, for the introduction. There you went. Uh, I'm pleased to be here this evening to talk a little bit about our experience with the Light the World Giving Machines. I move that? Okay. Um, I wanted to share that during the 2023 holiday season, the Chandler Care Center was one of six nonprofits that were chosen to be included in the Light the World Giving Machines in downtown Gilbert. And this was a really incredible opportunity for us. Um, I want to take a second to acknowledge Ellen Burgoyne from Just Serve, who was our contact, who really connected us with this. Ellen, do you want to wave your? There you go. Thank you, Ellen. Um, Ellen and the team from Just Serve have been deeply ingrained with the Care Center for many years, helping us, providing us volunteers and support. And she came to me and said, we'd like to consider including you in the Light the World Giving Machines. And it was an incredible opportunity. Between the middle of November and December 31st, the machines are open in downtown Gilbert. And as you can see in the pictures, they kind of look like a vending machine, but they allow the opportunity for community members to stop by anytime, 24 seven while they're open and they can select from, I believe there were 30 cards in the machines this year. And the care center was selected to have three cards in the machine, so residents could come up and purchase a card, and that donation 100% comes to us and the programs that we do. So this was obviously an incredible opportunity for the Chandler Care Center, for the kids we serve in CUSD, and for our Chandler community. Um, I did want to highlight some of the ways that the funds will be used that we were fortunate to receive this year. So $8,490 was received to provide access to STEM resources and materials. And these are really targeted to, in particular, families with children zero through five. So we're looking at getting in early and really providing those resources to those families that they can utilize at the care center and also take home with their families to do activities and projects at home. 19,500 pays for medical and dental appointments for 195 uninsured Chandler youth in our children's medical and dental clinic. And I don't know how many people know this, but the Chandler Care Center is very blessed to have a nonprofit children's medical and dental clinic in our facility that provides free medical and dental care to our uninsured youth. So that's an incredible blessing for us to be able to provide medical and dental care with those funds. And then $25,175 will help us provide family-friendly educational activities for CUSD, sorry, CUSD families who visit the Chandler Care Center. So all together, um, we are really proud to, I'm not gonna quite present the check yet because I'm actually going to invite the chairs for Light the World in Arizona, Stephen Fran Lauder and President Arnold to join me up here. And we're gonna show a really quick video about Light the World and then let them do the check presentation. So thank you. Would you like to join me?
Superintendent, Madam President, all the board members, we are grateful to be here. The Light the World Giving Machines have been around for seven years now. Uh, this year they were in 60 cities um, across the country and across the world where citizens like yourselves and friends and family like you could go up to a machine like this and select something that's very personal to you to give to someone else, uh, like some dialysis or an eye exam or counseling for a veteran. It's a very wonderful and spiritual experience as you're there during the Christmas season to be able to just feel a connection to someone else and feel a connection to what they will receive. We are so grateful for all of those in the East Valley who donated um, within um, Arizona this year. There were seven cities that had the giving machines and $1.5 million total raised for 30 charities. We are, we call them our heroes and those are those who run these uh, wonderful charities and are able to find ways um, to serve and give. And so to our heroes, we look forward to presenting this check. Superintendent and President, would you like to come down? Do you want a drum roll and give the total? <laughs> <laughs> I think Mr. Narducci, I think you're up with current events. Thank you. I didn't realize I had such a major role. <laughs> so, um, Madam President, members of the board, this week we welcome back our staff and students after a two-week spring break. I hope everyone has returned rested, rejuvenated, and ready to take on the fourth quarter. Um, community, I know those calendars are rough at times, and we do have Friday off as well. <laughs> so we're looking at future calendars as well. But um, I, again, this, I just want to remind folks that this Friday we uh, do have off for a spring, a spring observance day. Um, tomorrow, two, tomorrow here in Chandler, two exciting events are happening in COSD. So Chandler High School is hosting the second annual Arizona State University Career Exploration Day for juniors. Uh, students will be spending most of their day tomorrow. These are all the junior class at Chandler High participating in industry panels, various workshops, and a resource fair, including in employers, schools, and student organizations from ASU. So it's a great time that all of the ASU um, um, uh, staff come out and they show kids all of the opportunities and pathways that are there for them before their senior year. Also, Fry Elementary School will be hosting the, gran the grandson of Cesar Chavez. Uh, students from the San Marcos Elementary School will also be in attendance. The speaking engagement is one of a few events happening around Chandler this weekend ahead of uh, Cesar Chavez's birthday. All our excellent examples of uh, success occurring across the district. We will, of course, showcase these great happenings on social media and in our district newsletter, so just look for them. Right before the break, we uh, sent COSD families and COSD staff information on the creation of our teen violence advisory. We are still accepting applications from COSD stakeholders. You can find a direct link to the application on the district homepage. The deadline for the application is April 15th. I'd like to share a few updates uh, about the COSD arts department. Uh, we had a student perform the national anthem last night at the Chandler Police Department's awards banquet. 
Los Lobos dancers from Chandler High School were invited to dance for President Biden's CHIP Act announcement last week at Intel. Uh, two of the dancers who are in ROTC even had the chance to interview the Secret Service and talk about career pathways. Oh, cool. CUSD student art will be on display in our upcoming Chamber of Commerce event on April 24th. Lastly, I'd like to remind uh, the community that the district art show, and if you haven't been to this art show, it's like incredible. The, 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 the pieces that they have there from our students are amazing. Um, some of the artwork, if you ask the students, they are up for sale. I have one in my office that is amazing, I couldn't part with, but it's just, it's just incredible. Uh, this will be at the Chandler Center for the Arts Gallery. How many of you in this audience knew that there was an, there was an art display in the Chandler Center for the Arts? Good, about, n nice, well, well done, about three quarters of you. So make sure you know about it on April 17th so that you can head over there and see an example and wonderful partnership with the city. Well, the District Art Show will be free and open to the public. And again, like I said, enjoy what's there. Uh, but all the students, you would go through there thinking these are uh, young adults that have displayed their artwork. So uh, please get a chance to go over there and community members, if you're listening, uh, please take the time to go over there. It doesn't take very long. Um, and I'm sure our students would appreciate that. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Narducci. All right, um, next it's time for our citizens' comments, and I will um, have Ms. Singersall um, read our um, Thank you, Madam President. Warnings. <laughs> this is the time for public comment. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 38 43one h at the conclusion of the open call to the public, Individual members of the public body may respond to criticism made by those who have addressed the public body, may ask staff to review a matter, or may ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. However, members of the public shall not discuss or take legal action on matters raised during an open call to the public unless the matters are properly noticed for discussion and legal action. Thank you, Mrs. Ingersoll. Um, we have one speaker this evening, and um, we will have a timer set. The time will be three minutes. Um, Luann Savolt. Over there. Thank you very much for giving me this few minutes. Is this on? Can you hear okay? Okay. Um, I really, Ollie, would really you check, check, make sure? happy to see, here we go, happy to see so many good things going on in our school district. But we do have to be realistic, and some of the things that go on in the schools and in the community are not very good. So that's what I wanted to just talk for a minute about. I don't have any children in the school district, but I live in, Ch in Sun Lakes, and I do, am, I am impacted by the community as a whole, and I'm concerned about the children. It has come to my attention that there's a problem with violence, bullying, and drugs in the schools. I'm disturbed to hear about this. Students need to be safe in school, to hear that the students are, some students are afraid of going into the bathrooms, that really bothers me. So let's, as a community and board, work on solutions. I have a solution for part of this problem. How about drugs or dogs? How about drug-sniffing dogs? Hire a drug-sniffing dog and policeman slash security officer to do it in this way. Secure the entrance to the school that checks out everyone who enters the building have the team of dog and policemen take turns with schools. Let it be known that this team will be showing up at any time at any school to sniff out drugs. Any offenders will be arrested. I realize this doesn't take care of the whole problem, but this may be a start, and I do think we have to start someplace. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to our consent agenda. Mr. Narducci. 
Madam President, members of the board, I present the consent agenda for approval as printed and as published. Thank you. Could I please get a motion for approval of the consent agenda? Madam President, I would like to move that we approve the consent agenda as printed and published. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of approving our consent agenda, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have our only action item of the evening, and that is the elementary technology purchase. And I will turn it over to Mrs. Berry. Madam President, members of the board, a request for approval to purchase 2,800 student technology devices from Apple and Company for a total cost of $1,964,891.38. The devices will be distributed across 31 elementary schools. The purchase includes 10.9 inch iPads, protective hardware cases for keyboards, professional development for teachers, app Apple professional services, device management licenses, warranty. Devices will be distributed to second grade classrooms to increase engagement of students in small group structures and to provide individualized and small group intervention and extensions and reading um, result, uh, resulting. The district is requesting approval to purchase the items on the quote from Apple and Company in the amount of $1,964,891.38, utilizing the Mojave contract 21K Apple-0305, which complies with all school district procurement rules. Thank you, Mrs. Berry. Um, could I please get a motion on this? Um, Madam President, I would like to make a motion that we approve the request to purchase 2,800 student technology devices uh, at the cost of $1,964,891.38 um, as presented by Ms. Berry. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Are there any questions or comments um, or discussion from the board? Um, could I please, um, when you're talking about some of the, uh, these are going to second grade students, correct? They are um, all second grade students, yes. And how is this going to assist um, those students with uh, making sure that they are um, reading at grade level by third grade? Sure, and I actually have Jessica Edgar here to talk about that and Sean Green also, so I'm going to let Jessica address that one. Absolutely. So a few years ago, we adopted our HMH uh, ELA curriculum in K-6, and part of that was a digital component, which is actually presented in a way that is best for our developmentally for second grade students to be able to use that iPad and really use station rotation within that tier one instructional setting to get to those objectives, uh, all aligned with the state standards, but really um, just another resource or a tool to really engage our students in a different manner to meet those expectations for third grade, move on when reading. Now, will these um, devices be ones that are only used in the classroom as a one-to-one -one device situation, or will they be taken home? So to my knowledge, they are not going to be taken home. We do have our Director of Educational Technology, Sean Crichton, who can discuss a little bit more about the actual technology. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Madam President, <laughs> members of the board. Um, yeah, you're, what you said is absolutely correct. These are one-to-one -one devices that are meant to be uh, used it in the classroom and then left left there overnight for for charging and that that sort of thing. Not taken home. And there are then um, printed materials that will supplement the digital or vice versa, and so that there won't be any, um, I guess, missing those devices um, when they're at home. Um, yeah, so there's print material and there's also supplementary material that's been vetted that we can be used depending on our depending on what our teachers decide is what's most instructionally beneficial to that student's individual needs. Okay, great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I was wondering, what is the expected lifespan with this model? I want to say that's four years, but four to five years, is that correct? Yeah, that's our typical lifespan for those types of devices is four to five years. That's the cycle we're trying to get on. Um, Apple devices in general have very good long-term value, so we're, we're pleased about that. Okay. All right, if there's no other questions, um, we'll go ahead and, and vote on this. All those in favor of the uh, 2,800 uh, student technology devices, uh, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. 
Next, we have our information items, our student activity, auxiliary operations, and tax credit reports. Mrs. Berry. Madam President, members of the board, the student activities, auxiliary operations, and tax credit reports for the months ending July 2023 through February 2024 are provided for your review. Thank you, Mrs. Perry. Are there any questions or comments from board members? No? Thank you. Next, um, Dr. Gilbert, transition to the Trust Model Policy Program. Madam President, members of the board, the COSD policy transition from ASBA to the Trust Model Policy is presented as information and will return as an action for your approval on April 10th, 2024. Thank you. Um, board members, do we have any um, Questions, comments? I know we had a presentation on a study session, but this is actually the each one of the policy, um, policy chapters um, that are here on the um, in board docs. No voting. No, vo no, no, voting. no voting, but if you have any questions or comments on it or have noticed typographical errors or whatever. <laughs> so if you do notice uh, board members, if you do notice anything, um, uh, you know, as you reread them or whatever, um, between now and the next meeting when they will be on the agenda for approval, um, please get a hold of uh, Dr. Gilbert um, and show him where those typos are, because okay, occasionally some of them slip through no matter what <laughs> what you do, it seems like. President, President, just, um I just wanted to explain for the audience here that when a policy is brought or discussed, it first comes to information item under the current policies, which are ASBA's policy that we're using right now, come to the come to us in their first meeting as a discussant item, and then the vote happens when it comes as an action item, uh, where you can discuss it or where you can change it or before moving it forward to a vote. So the vote would come at the next presentation of the item. Yes, which should be on the April 10th meeting. All right, um, we will move on to um, uh, a, po a couple of policy discussions. Um, let me get that up on my agenda. Um, at the, um, Mr. Roars had requested that the board have a discussion of the following policies. Um, our first topic is the um, the policy on with student concerns, complaints, and grievances, um, and his topic on this was retaliation concerns. And um, the policy is, is listed for all of the, or um, in our documents, um, the current policy um, that does talk about um, where retaliation is um, prohibited. Um, Mr. Roars, um, do you have, um, could you tell us, I guess, what your thoughts were on this and what, um, I guess, maybe deficiencies you're seeing in this policy? Certainly. Um, but before I begin, I'd like to recognize the Honorable Chuck Bongiovanni, who's on the Gilbert Town Council and has been leading their effort uh, on teen violence to address it in their community as well. And thank you for being here. Um, so with the introduction, I would say that students must feel safe in our schools. In order to maintain the safety and security of students with, within our care and the smooth operation of schools, we've developed administrative policies that describe rules to enforce those purposes. Many of these policies derive directly from Arizona revised statutes, commonly known as state law. These policies are reviewed and then approved by the governing board. In order for the district administration to successfully execute on those policies, there must be these elements. The policy must be clearly defined. The policy must be effectively communicated. And the policy must be diligently enforced. I have some concerns that not all these are being achieved successfully. So I did ask for a review of these policies on three particular items. One is a loitering policy where some students report they're afraid to use the bathrooms on campus for be fear of being intimidated, bullied, or assaulted. There are also other complaints the bathrooms are also used for drug use and other undesirable activities. 
I'm proposing that students be prohibited from loiter loitering in the bathrooms or other areas that are outside the view of staff. The district has proposed new policy update. Current policy directly address this issue and define disciplinary actions. SROs and staff should be directed to make random spot checks of student bathrooms to discourage gatherings and these undesirable activities. Retaliation policy appears that some situations escalate after a victim is discovered to have made a complaint about an assailant. Students should be prohibited from retaliating on or off campus against other, another person for reporting an incident. The district proposed new policy to update or current policy directly address this issue and define disciplinary actions. Number three, a social media sharing policy. Incidents on or off campus are often recorded by student bystanders and published to social media. This violates the rights of students that are shown in these rec recordings. Students should be prohibited from sharing or publishing social media posts of other students without their express permission. District propose new policy or update current policy to directly address this issue and define disciplinary actions. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Gilbert, who put together a good presentation of the policy we have it currently placed so the public can understand what we do and why we do it, and then open it up for some questions. Dr. Gilbert? Well, I could start with the uh, retaliation policy. Um, I guess my question would be, um, Anything that you would like to see changed in any of these policies, we would need to have some discussion to make sure I understand clearly what that would be, what that looks like. Because if any changes that we would have in whether it's the logistics, the operation of our policy, or what the policy states, we'd need to make sure that we can put it in place effectively and make sure that we can manage and communicate it out. When we look at the policy as it relates to student concerns, complaints, and grievances, as it relates to retaliation, in that policy, probably, um, if you give me a moment. I have it right here, Dr. I, I got it. Okay. And it right, relates to retaliation, it's probably halfway down. Um, retaliation or intimidating acts against the student is in the policy, so I would guess um, based on the three pieces that you shared, clarity, communication, and enforcement, um, I think from a clarity, um, the policy is there. The information is there. This information is in the student handbooks that is asked by the students to be reviewed. It's checked off by parents every year. Um, and so it's also in the handbook um, to be shared. So I think for the policy, I don't know that I just from right off see a, a change in that, but it doesn't mean that it can't be communicated better um, out into our community, to our parents, to our students. We can look to see how we can um, do that. And enforcing, I think it's going to be us look at the data and see what is it that we're hearing or what's out there, um, I guess, to start with. But in any of these, I don't have an answer for you tonight because I think there needs to be more discussion on what where is it where is it failing, what is the data that is being used to say that it's it's not being uh, utilized appropriately or it's not being communicated appropriately or it's not being enforced appropriately, and we can take some time to sit down and see what that is and and I think that's going to be on many of the policies that you have here when it goes into. Um, Social media sharing, uh, appropriate use of cyber and cyber bullying. I think that's going to be another piece of what are we talking about when we talk about social media sharing. If it has to do with something happening on a campus and students videotaping and doing something with that, we currently address that from a from the perspective of um, how technology is being used and their discipline that comes from that realm. But if it has to do with how students are utilizing it outside of school that is not in um, line with what's happening at a school and it's outside of school, there's, you know, we'd have to look at what does that mean. Um, as it relates to bullying, there is a statute as to what we have to follow and that information is also um, in um, our policy and it is state driven. And the process that has to be used, I think, is clear. So we'd have to look at where is there a, a falling off based on what you have shared 
as to the enforcement of that policy or the clarity of parents because it's in the handbook, it's in our policy, it's on the website, um, and it is something that every year parents have to check off that they've read as well as students seeing it in the classroom. Um, so for some of those, I think it, it's going to be sitting down to really understand the data that is um, sharing or showing that this is not being enforced or how it's not being enforced or how it's not being clear, and then we can see how we can do a better job. Okay. Can I just address one thing you said? And the concern is about off-campus incidents, because I've heard the comment from administration they do not believe that incidents that occur off-campus have any disciplinary interest for the district. So policy GICK, which we're talking about here, appears to be unclear regarding off-campus actions, but then restricts those advantages to those what the district is expected to have reasonable control. So a hypothetical is a connected incident that occurs later that evening. So in discussions with other public officials, including the Maricopa County Attorney, the Pinal County Sheriff, a Maricopa County Sheriff's Deputy, and a Mesa School member, this does not appear to be the case. The prevailing opinion is that incidents that occur off campus that are connected to a previous on-campus incident are definitely within disciplinary interest of the district. And I would refer you to Supreme Court decision, Mahonoy School District versus BL, the use of the initials if it's minor, 2021, which decided that a school may have a regulatory interest when an off-campus speech concerns bullying and harassment. These other acts include substantial interference with the work at school, so kids bullied and afraid to go to class, depending upon the rights of other students and a quite right to an expiration of privacy, so jump on a kid in the bathroom, and threats targeting certain in individuals. So Mesa's public school district is also struggling with these issues and appears to be taking a much stricter approach to controlling student behavior. I suggest that the CSD administration coordinate their respective approaches to see what better approaches we can make. If I can clarify, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly, but I don't believe I said that if it happens off campus, there's nothing we can do. It really depends on if there's a nexus to the campus, and we do that now. If something happens off campus and there's no connection to the school, that is not something that we can actually um, discipline for, or we would be in court because we would overstep our bounds of something that occurred outside of the school. Yeah, that's, I think, the clarification that needs to be in policy. It's unclear, and the public needs to understand that what we can and cannot do Thank you for that. Um, so, uh, um, Mr. Rohr, so um, I do believe that um, we have legal counsel that can assist us with something like that, but what specifically are you recommending then um, for, I mean, we have a series of um, two, um, eight policies here that, or so. Um, that we are we're talking about um, with the forms and the um, um, the things that you're you're looking for, and I guess the question is um, what what suggestions specifically um, in each one of those are are you are you saying um, you're you're kind of generalizing um, about I guess where is the data that we're showing that some of these things are um, that you, uh, the things that you're having issues with. Where's the data that says um, either we're not communicating it out or the people don't understand it um, or that people don't know about it since all of our parents are signing um, um, the handbooks every year. Um, I mean, and if, if, if parents aren't reading it, I mean, that's, and, and just signing it, I mean, that's, um, I mean, we, are you saying maybe put something that says this is a, you know, a, a legal document that you're signing, and um, you know, so make sure you read it, or or what? Okay, well, you kind of switch subjects on me, but I wanted to address that anyway. So the second point I made is making sure that policy is effectively communicated. So what we do is we hand parents at the very beginning of school your whole stack of papers to sign. Most of them don't read it. You're correct, but. Also, by admitting that, you're also admitting that it's not effectively communicated, and people don't know this. We need to do it. I asked a question on that. Are you are you saying that you know people aren't reading it? I mean, is that what 
Well, the other thing we do is we post it on the main office, and what else do we do? We have the parent packet sign it, we review it the first day of school. I'm saying it's not adequate. I'd like to see a better approach to that. What would you now, recommend? Now, if I have to write it? What, no, no. You just have to give us suggestions of, you're, you're very general in what your want is, um, but besides those three manners, going over it with the students, having the handbook in the handbook, having it, having parents sign it, um, and then having it posted, and then having it posted on website, as well as actually what you're doing right now is simplifying. So when parents want to look at policy, they just have to go to the parents section. Um, where before, like like we've had, for example, retaliation is in seven different policies in ASBA, and you guys actually taking the effort of moving towards the trust kind of clears this all up, so they don't have to look at retaliation, which is covered in seven different po parts of different policies, whether it be hazing, whether it be um, cyberbullying, but the retaliation policy alone is in seven different components. Now, when we go to the new policy, if you vote for it uh, at the next meeting, um, it'll be in one area. So that'll be an easier uh, shopping for parents to be able to look and find things as well. Um, so I think that will help clarify as well. But I, I was just asking for um, if there's any uh, suggestions for options that the board would want to discuss so we have something to grow on. Um, and be able to move toward because outside of those three things every poli we have so many things that happen in a day that go to different policy pieces it all depends on what's important to whom at that time um, so the whole policy manual gets used uh, we do have it posted on the website as well at free access to parents uh, to students even and to those that want to um, so I don't I've just had a loss of what additional things you would like to suggest Okay, so I think we've gotten past the point or the fact that it's not effectively communicated because people don't know. They really don't, okay? I, now, I, 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 Mr. Rice, I, I, I disagree with you. I will disagree with you on that. Well, let me finish, okay? It's not effectively communicated. We know that, okay? That, that, you know, that's not something we're gonna argue. Now, do you want me to give you specific procedures to do so? To tell you, I don't want to. I want you to administer your own district. Okay? Can you find a better way to communicate this so people understand it? <coughs> That's what I'm asking. I'll, you know, I'll give you the option sure. of figuring out how to we, do it. We'll look at other ways that it's communicated. We can besides have. the ways that are naturally done in school districts and um, under that scope, and, and see if we can generate a list of other ways we can communicate it. I have a suggestion, maybe we like, before you can bring your kid to the school, we have you read all the policy and you have to take a test and you have to pass it by like 75% and then, then you can have your kid in school. Or you can sign that say that you accept those rules, just like when you sign your driver's license thing, that means you accept those rules. I don't think that would be feasible. Right, no, um, maybe but not, I do maybe wanna, not. I want to call a point of order. I just I think we're re reframing the question here, maybe because um, this was a discussion on policy. But what I'm hearing is that it's really about communicating on our on our current policy. Is that right, Board Member Rorsch? Yes, but the second point I made was policy must be effectively communicated. That is an administrator responsibility. You're correct. So I think um, just reframing the question is how can we better communicate our policy? And um, I think we are taking steps towards that right now as we transition to the trust. I know um, it can be a little anxious because it's not public yet, but we have had the chance and I actually invite the public, you can visit other districts that operate under the trust um, current policies in other districts to get an idea of how much more user friendly um, the display will be on the user end. I've done that both as a parent and as a board member knowing that we're making this transition. Um, there's even a search bar uh, which is much friendlier than what we have today. Mm -hmm. So I, I do expect that this transition will help towards better communicating policy to the public. And Mrs. Serrano, um, additionally, in our information items, uh, all of those policies that we are looking at approving are listed in there so that the public can look over them and, and take a look and see um, what there is 
avail how it's going to be very different than what we have right now. And so those are those that are available to everyone. Um, uh, just go to our agenda for for this meeting, and th those are there. And uh, President Mazin, uh, members of the board. Um, so on the website, um, and some people may not know this, but on the website, there's you go under administration, then governing board, and then there's options in there to go, go to a policy manual. So there's a public view of the policy manual, which has every single policy in there. I, I will say ASBA's policies are extensive, and they're 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 not organized like the trust policies that uh, that hopefully um, uh, we're moving toward are. Um, and I agree with you, um, Member Serrano, and 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 uh, Member Roars. I think there there's going to be a lot easier format for people to be able to find and seek policy in that new format. But I just want to remind folks that's where it's housed. So if people are looking for certain policy pieces, they're they're right there under public view. And and July first, the new trust policies, if it's passed by the board, will be in that same location. I have a, a comment. I, I think we got a little bit wrapped around the axle on, on publication and notification about policies, but um, mem member roars did have some good comments about loitering and social media and, and retaliation and stuff like that. So, um, but Kurt, if you do have, you know, certain things in here that we, you know, you, you think we should do different or better or parts of it that, that you think we need to work on, make, make you know, let us know. Yes, thank you. Um, one thing I also wanted to bring up before we move on here, I had a question because it wasn't clear to me. So in policy I, J, and D, C. Could you say that again? Um, when you turned away from the mic, I couldn't hear. Policy I, J, and D, C, the appropriate use of technology. The question I had because it wasn't clear to me, do the restrictions listed there apply to personal technologies as well as district provided technology? So kids' personal cell phone using it to bullying, harassment, and such, they do. Okay. Um, maybe take a look at the language when we get finished with the transition to make sure it's very clear. Uh, I'm not so sure that the students nor the public understand that. The last thing I, I wanted to make a comment on was uh, reporting of incidents. Some parents complain that school principals or other staff members have been making decisions on which incidents are reported to law enforcement for investigation preferring to keep the matter internal to the school. Law enforcement are the only ones that can make the decisions to investigate, arrest, or refer to prosecution. Students that are suspected of violating a law. We have SROs at each junior high school, and each high school, they are trained to carry out those, those duties. This is not an administrative function. Staff members have no authority to circumvent the reporting of suspected crimes. What I mean by this is the SROs need to be involved in each of these incidents and they will decide whether there's a prosecution. And then we come in second, if there's not, mm -hmm. with our administrative decisions on that. It's not the other way around. Um, so, so, Mr. Wars, um, let me just ask for clarification. So, so when a police investigation is to take place, they'll notify us and they take, they take, they take the investigation over. Um, and then we, they'll tell us either we can pull back or we continue our investigation, which, which is governed by our policies, right? But if it's any investigation outside of the school realm of policy, we, we sometimes, you're correct, they will take the lead and, and we will take secondary position until they tell us we can. Um, and so I think that's what, that's what you were saying, right, is when an investigation is occurring in policy, once police or, or sheriff's department are, are involved, they they take over that investigation. They may tell us that we are not investigating at this time. Yeah, and what I'm getting to is there is no policy that I can find that says this is the priority. If there's a suspected crime, you talk to law enforcement first before starting your investigation. And then they decide if they want to continue or not and turn it back to you. They have priority look at it, looking at incidents. We don't. And I, I have heard stories, and I have, can't... Uh, testified at the last year of those that, you know, principals or staff members said, well, I'm just not going to report that. We don't think it's, you know, necessary. That's not their decision. I think it needs to be very clear in the policy. Okay? We have mandatory reporting laws very specific about child abuse and such, but I think that it does extend to 
some of the activities that we see on campus. And Mr. Rourke, um, sometimes though the administration does need to at least find out what happened, which is the very beginning steps of um, an investigation. Um, and as they start to find out what's going on, then they find out that this needs to be reported to the police because they, at first they have no, um, they don't have the realization that something hasn't happened because they don't have enough information. So I think that, you know, we're going to have to, do they report everything to the, you know, there's going to have to be very, very specific um, rules if they find out if there has been something that could be illegal, let's say it's drugs on campus or something that like that. That policy needs to be defined. And I think the SROs need to be brought in far earlier in the process. In, you know, just as an aside, in this district, we've gotten some very serious trouble where we've tried to handle uh, an incident on campus that turned out to be a serious crime, and then law enforcement stepped in, and then we're in big trouble because we didn't do what we were supposed to do. Well, there's a, um, there's kind of always been in every school and they all, that any of us went to um, kind of a range of behaviors that were accepted and, and taken care of by administra administrators or teachers. So when a first grader pushes down another first grader on the playground, you know, if, if it was somebody doing that out here in the hallway, that would be assault. If, if you do it on the playground for some reason, it's not. So, you know, the extreme of that is every time a first grader pushes down another first grader, you call the police. You know, we have to, we, there's, there's, there's a range of, there's a range of things there and we've always, as a society, found a balance of when to call the cops and when not to when things are happening at school, right? Well, let's not take this to the range of absurdity. Um, well, no, it's, it's that's, that's, that's actually, that's actually what happens when a first grader pushes another first grader down, that's assault, right? And I've never seen a first grader arrested for that, so. Right. But I'm far more concerned about kids at our schools or after school with poor kids jumping them. Well, yes. Over at, that, that needs to be reported right away. That's the other end of the SRO spectrum. SRO needs yeah. to be involved right up front. Okay? They may or may not decide to do anything, but that's their choice. Then we take it from there. That's the point. May I add something? Is it okay if I add something? Certainly. I think what we have to be careful of is understanding that each policy is a policy in itself. So when you're talking about a range of things that occur, you have to first start, was it hazing, was it assault, was it bullying, was it harassment, was it a fire, was it something that you did? You have to look at the policy based on that and you'll, it'll give you the process of everything you have to do. One of the things I would suggest when you have some time and you're drinking coffee or tea, that when you have some time to read, I would go to our student handbook and go to the discipline matrix that's there. In the discipline matrix, you will see to the right, based on everything that could happen from a disciplinary perspective, and it'll give you a range of what can happen. If police are supposed to be called, that's specific on there. And it's there for a reason, so that parents know that if this occurs, police are notified. And so, again, I think it goes back to the communication piece, because the policy and the, the, the information's there. It's making sure people know where it is, where to go, and it's being enforced, which goes to number two and number three of the three things that you said it was important. So I think that's where the focus in, in my opinion, needs to be. It's not that things don't exist. It's not that policy doesn't exist. It's not that direction doesn't exist. It's making sure the communication, which was number two, and the enforcement of it, which is number three, is actually occurring when you're looking at it. But I would suggest look at the handbook and look at the, the discipline matrix, whether it's a fight, whether it's assault, whether it's a sexual harassment, whether it's harassment, whether it's bullying, it'll go and tell you what the range is that is of discipline as well as whether police are going to be notified. So something to think about. So if there's an incident where a parent wants to file a complaint, we get these all the time, should the first line of that is please look at the student handbook so you have a good understanding of our policies? Actually, if, a parent, is, if a parent is going to make a complaint, I go to JII, which is the first thing you put on here, mm -hmm. because that's a grievance and a complaint. And there's a, an actual process that goes with that in a time frame of when it has to be done. And that's also in the handbook that they, that they will get that information from. But what from. I was getting at, if they read the handbook before they file the complaint, 
maybe we could start to sort these out a little bit more. Yeah, well, it, it also becomes chicken and egg. Who's going to do what when, right? And so there are some, if you look at what I shared today of the five policies that we, if you approve in April, we're going to, um, it seems very small, which is good. It's smaller than what we have. It's still 200 and something pages. If you look at our current policy that has 12 chapters to it, it's extensive. So understanding there's a lot of information and, and the, policies, the policies are specific to something that occurred. So you have to go back to all of that information. So the, the, I think there, there needs to be more discussion on this. I hear what you're, what you're saying, but I think we're, we're trying to make it too narrow as to what can be done when there's, a, there's always a variation of things that can occur just for one thing because it depends on what happened in the inception of that incident as to how you're going to approach it. There are times that you may have something that starts off very small, and once you start doing an investigation, you, real, you realize there, that it's big. So you have to be careful as you're going through and what you determine. And you may not find that information out until you talk to the fifth or sixth person. So it just depends on what happens when, in, when that takes place. It's, it's not as simple as this happened at A and then B occurred and then we went to Z and everything was good. It weaves in and out the whole time. Yeah, I understand what you say, but that's the, the process of the investigation. But I can assure you, parents do not understand this, and we need to tell them better. If something happens, here's what we're going to do about it. That's what they want to know. Mrs. Serrano? Um, I'm going to chime in here as um, a parent of a high schooler who has actually gone through a very personal experience uh, with a teenager that was assaulted after school on campus. And because this happened within my family and I have a child that was assaulted, I can speak with testimony on the procedure that took place, I would say within 10 minutes before I was ever, could even, I just cared about my kid's safety and I wasn't even thinking I was gonna contact the school. It took place after school hours. And the school called me. And somehow, I, I honestly, I, I don't know how, but they completed a sort of investigation because there was um, eyewitnesses. And so it was immediately reported. And they contacted me as a parent who, whose child was going through, had just gone through an assault. So um, when we, I just want to be clear that this isn't happening, you know, in all of our schools. And I hate to share my personal story, to be honest, but I, I do want to clear that narrative because I had to go through that. And it, it was a terrible experience that I wouldn't um, want on any other family. My, my child was safe, but I want to be clear that I, I didn't think, uh, well, what am I going to do next or worry about contacting the school? I just wanted to know as any parent, right, get my kid home. Uh, decompress them and make them feel safe because it was a scare. But within the mo by the time we got home, I got a phone call is what I want to share. And it was from an administrator <laughs> at the high school. And they already had created a plan for my child to go back to summer school. They were, it was a mixed summer school class. And everything was safe from that point forward. There was a plan it was stuck to. And things were explained to me. And when I was asked if I wanted to charge assault charges, I also want to be clear that not all of us want to do that as parents. And we chose not to do that. And there are people that understand um, you know, these behaviors, uh, teenage behaviors, and not wanting to contribute to what we do know can be a school to prison pipeline over a mistake right, that we should be working on the behavior issue and not necessarily just reprimanding kids and throwing them the buck that could lead to a lot of other things in some situations. And this these behaviors have such a wide range, and I think that's what Dr. Gilbert was alluding to, that when we do create policy, we have to be so careful um, not to have underlying implications that we didn't mean, like the first grader example. But when we look at procedures, now that can look different depending on what we're looking at specifically. 
So I think it's important to, to know that there's policy and then we have procedures, right? And procedures will be more detailed um, and have higher expectations than what policy is supposed to cover as an umbrella. Thank you, Mrs. Serrano. Um, I think at this point, Mr. Wars, if I know that you have looked through a lot of these policies um, very specifically and have some, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, um, some very specific, perhaps, suggestions that we could either utilize to clarify um, some of the sections that you don't believe are, is, are really clear, or um, suggestions on uh, perhaps broadening or making, in, including other things that are not necessarily included in there, like um, the locations of where things happen or whatever. Um, could you make a list of those and give them to Dr. Gilbert? Well, I would prefer to sit down with Dr. Gilbert and work through it because it's okay. Really that would be great. Could you a discussion? And I think he's actually the guy that knows the most about this. So, because that would be, I think, very, very helpful. I and mean, then um, I think that that I think you know there there's probably a lot of tweaks or some tweaks that can be made to make these clearer, um, so that people know exactly what to expect and and under and even um dr gilbert even i think i don't believe i saw the word like nexus in some of our policies um that we were doing and maybe even kind of i, I probably about, wouldn't use that word but, but it is linked it is, to the school or something along those lines must have saw me hit my mic on because i was going to just suggest that we sit down and have a conversation it's usually connected <laughs> yeah the, uh, in, in, Dr. Gilbert was right about the uh, in the handbook. There's a there's an infraction glossary that has what the acts are and then ranges of of things that are done. That's good reading. Okay, so our next so then our next steps will be having Mr. Wars get with Dr. Gilbert and then um, we can get that um, I guess linked out to the board on on and. Talk about it. Madam President, and also with uh, Mr. Roar's statements, we have some things we'll start discussing tomorrow too, um, and his other pieces that he gave us. I think okay. he gave us enough of uh, communication pieces that we can get together on that as okay. well. And that's a great idea. Throw in the point that we're also going to review all the policies anyway. Yeah, we're correct. In the process, I guess, starting now. Mm -hmm. So, actually, at this point, um, I had suggested this, and I'll ask you if it's permissible. There. Are Members of the community out here that may want to weigh in on this for a minute or two, um, if they could be. This is um, well. Is that what that is? I do. Yes. This um, and I believe we have some right there. These are some forms that if you have any comments about um, that you would like to provide some input on some of the policies, um, it's a very simple form to talk about which policy it is and um, put your name and your a contact phone number. Uh, these will go to our administration, um, and we would appreciate um, any input that you have. If someone would also like to perhaps um, say a couple of words as to, um, we can open that up too, but if not, um, we would really appreciate, um, and please try and be as detailed as possible on, on your, your comments um, on, the, on the green forms. So. Okay, because right. I, I think it's crucial, vitally crucial, that the community is involved with this. Because this is not only in our schools, but it's their kids in our schools. But obviously there's a connection to outside of the school too, you know, when they're off campus. And we need to recognize that and work with, you know, the other school districts, work with the municipalities, and work with law enforcement, so they're all on the same page. And that's the only way that we're going to make some improvement on this. So. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Would you like to speak? Yes. Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Burton. Um, so I wasn't really planning on speaking tonight. But after listening, can you hear me OK? That's better. Sorry. Thank you. After listening to what was said by everybody, I came a little bit late. Um, I'm going to strongly disagree with quite a few of you up there. There is a problem. It needs to be analyzed. And I think there needs to be held accountability for these processes. The investigation is not the school's job. It is the police's job. 
Um, for example, myself has an incident that just occurred at Castile High School. About a few months ago, there's a substitute teacher there. Substitute teacher took pictures of a bunch of girls doing TikTok. I recently <coughs> found out about it. My ex-wife and I are not together. Um, despite the court order that says we both get information, never had a problem with it. I was never informed. My daughter was in the classroom, interviewed by the principal, Mr. Phillips. I was still not informed. I recently found out. I went into the school, talked to the assistant principal, because Mr. Phillips is not there. F I'm furious. After talking to them, she had no idea what was going on. The assistant principal. No idea that there was a potential sexual, I don't know if you want to call it assault, whatever you want to call it. That's in, but throughout the conversation, she slowly started to mention that she had heard basically water talk, water cooler talk. Little bit of information she had heard. So I asked her, I said, aren't you a leader? Aren't you a leader of our school watching our kids? Shouldn't you know these things? If there's a potential problem, you should know these things. The entire school should be notified of this. Now Castile has already a history of some of these incidences, as we all know. During COVID, we were all informed when somebody at the school had COVID. When someone was in the class, no, someone was in, we were informed. I was never informed. She slowly let out a few information, pieces of information that I did not tell her. And I called her out for it. I asked, actually I demanded to have an interview with Mr. Nayuchi three weeks ago. I'm still waiting for that phone call. So I disagree with what you're saying. I'm sorry what happened to your kid. But it is the job of the police to investigate because clearly the school is not doing it. So I'm really sorry what happened to your kid and that was your choice, but I should have been notified. Can I ask you if our, our secondary um, director over secondary schools contacted you? Did our uh, nobody has contacted director? me since I went in there. Okay, and you, you talked to the school and you've called here? I went and talked to the assistant uh, principal. I forget her name off the top of my head. Okay. Um, I asked for Mr. Phillips. He was gone that day. Okay. I so was not informed. I informed her also okay. that I specifically have paperwork in there where I'm supposed to be notified. I was not notified. Well, that's the first time I'm hearing of that. So if you'd like to meet with me, I'd be happy to. I would love to meet you okay. because to me, I want to know why we don't have a policy. If there's a potential um, teacher. Are, is there any specific, a specific suggestion on policy that you would like to make yes. this evening? If there's a problem at my school or my kid's school, I deserve to know as a parent that the leaders of that school are protecting my children while I'm not. So whether okay. it's COVID, whether it's potential sexual assault in another classroom, whether it's a bully, whether it's anything to that extent, it's just an email to let me know. Okay. So then I can make a choice. Thank you. Could you uh, leave your number with Mr. James here and I'll give you a call. Yes, I will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes. We need to make sure it's related to pol to a suggestion for policies, please. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to speak over here, but it is really serious uh, according for the bully because I'm go through right now and my son got mild concussion from school, from PE class. And the school principal and vice principal, they didn't notice to the parents. I believe within 30 minutes. And they didn't give any medical assistance. When the school principal called me, vice <coughs> principal called me during the phone call, she mentioned, she mentioned to me, she mentioned, mentioned, mentioned to me said, your son fighting with another kid and he is the troublemaker. And I immediately asked her if my son got any head injury. She said no, but she said my son had RED red mark on his face. And I immediately asked her what happened without head injury and there's red mark. And she wasn't handled the situation. She is misleading 
we emailed to the principal, and I know you wanted me to stop, right? Oh, so I can stop. Yeah. My English is yeah. good, but as mom, I need to be, be strong. It's happened for a week, and right now, the situation became worse, and no school, no school district communication with us. I don't know if this is for the public or not. I'm so disappointed because kids supposed to be safe go to school, supposed not fair go to school. He is really scared to go back to school right now because the children who punched him for the concussion, he also post his, he, the school had an affair. He posted his comment as encouraged from the school said, they will beat my son when my son go back to the school from the TikTok, from his friend, from the school, the kids, my son didn't know that kids. And also we report to the school, we report to the police. We also report to the districts. Mm -hmm. And also I didn't get any answer. So the day before yesterday, I went to the court. I get the protection order from the judge. Um, so what, Emma, ma'am, I'm, I'm, ma 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 I'm sorry that happened to your son. I know we're talking about policy. Yes, um, the policy, but, but if I, can, I want to add two more yeah. sentences. I agree with the lady who mentioned earlier during the restroom, the school should be make kids safe. And mm -hmm. I know the kids has a smoking, fighting in the bathroom, in the locker room. And what happened, like this gentleman with orange shirt, he said, please, let parents know the children, it's children, they cannot make a decision. Let parents know immediately, please. Okay, ma'am, thank, thank you, you very much. I, I appreciate you coming with your I'm concerns. I'm so sorry for you ma guys. Ma'am, I wanted to talk to you. Um, thank you for coming. And um, no child should have to be in a situation like that. I do know this situation here, and I know you filed a GAICK form, which is the policy you would use, so you did a nice job. I know you talked with Mr. Wars, and that was a really great thing that you did, and I know it's very emotional for you. I know the schools met with you, and I know they've talked with you. I know you met here with Mr. Serrano. Uh, do you remember meeting with Mr. Dan Serrano for two hours, you and your husband? And so you did meet with district officials as well. Um, and that was just a, that just occurred recently, but we will continue to look into it and we will follow your GICK complaint and we will work with that and get back with you on those pieces. We also have some video pieces too that we'd, we'd like to show you too of the involvement of your child. So, yes. Yes, they, they talked with you on the investigation, yeah. They talked with you on the investigation and for two hours you met with Mr. Serrano and there was feedback there, but we will look into the JICK complaint uh, that you did file. So thank you. Uh, we will look into that definitely. Okay. We are going to move on to our, I, I do appreciate hearing from, from the two individuals that spoke. And please, um, if you do have any other um, input, we would like to hear it very, very much. Um, I am, our next is just some minor things, our agenda roadmap, our next meeting is going to be in two weeks, which is uh, April 10th. Uh, we will be looking at, um, <coughs> we'll have, be having uh, a DECA and uh, Arizona College Prep Marketing presentation. We will look, be looking at the trust policy, um, the policy recommendations, and I believe we will also be having a study session on our strategic plan. Correct. Is there anything else that is coming up on that? Okay. Cur uh, board member current events. So, on a lighter note, um, we've been off for two weeks. There wasn't a lot going on. Um, but uh, I did want to say that on March 2nd, Perry did play Millennium in the state basketball championships. Um, 
I was so proud of these guys. They got down big at the very beginning of the game and just scratched back and scratched back and finally took it away from them. You should see these kids play. Um, they are one of the best teams in the country. So March 7th, on the other side of the academic spectrum, uh, Channel High School, they had their build for tomorrow, um, I guess, career event. Uh, I went to that. It was well attended. A lot of employers there got to talk to a lot of different uh, parents and teachers and employers. You know, we should do this often as well. Um, March 10th, we met with, or I met with the uh, Parents Against Teen Violence over in Queen Creek, and it was a very good meeting. In fact, Chuck was there, as a matter of fact. And we had a very good discussion. A lot of it surrounded what the rules are and what we can do and what we can't do. And that's why I made the comment, I don't think parents understand this very well at all. We could do a much better job communicating about how these situations are handled. And then, um, March 24th, just recently, there was a Gilbert teen violence upstander event over, actually across the street from Basha High School. That was also well attended. So, you know, this issue is not going away, okay? More and more parents are getting engaged. So I think we've got to have a very substantial response to it. I think we need to look to the community to work together with them as partners instead of adversaries, because sometimes they feel that they're being turned off or not listened to. I hear that quite a bit. But um, if we do our job properly, we can turn this around and make it a much safer environment, both in schools and outside of schools for our kids. And I think that's what everybody wants. So thank you. Mr. Olive? Um, nothing new. I didn't have to go to school for the last two weeks. That was good. Um, Kurt, I'm, I'm sorry, I do make facetious comments sometimes, so, but but like the policy we, you know, I, I guess it's something you have to kind of work through slow and, 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 and very meticulously and say, okay, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the details here? How does this affect people? That's what Dr. Gilbert's really great at. So thank you very much, Dr. Gilbert, for taking all that time to work on policy stuff. Um, <coughs> that's awesome. That was it. Thank you. Mrs. Serrano? Um, I do want to take a moment to appreciate um, our parent comments tonight and sharing your personal family stories. I know that's not easy. And just as a reminder, beyond those green comment cards, if you visit CUSD80.com right now, as Superintendent Narducci mentioned, our home website has the link to join our teen advisory, teen um, violence advisory committee. I think a lot of these comments and policy requests do directly tie to how are we keeping our kids safe? And if you have the time and would consider joining, that could be a good fit to help drive improvements. Um, I'm also honestly sorry that things aren't always handled at our school sites and you have to come here at our board meetings and make a weekday evening time to address your issues. We need to do better, and I see that. Um, and I think you know we're taking steps to, to do so. Um, obviously, we're back for our, for our last quarter of the school year, so I do hope everybody had a good break. Um, we do have some events that I wanna highlight and invite community to. <coughs> This weekend, there will be special events honoring Cesar Chavez, who actually has a special legacy here in Chandler, having opened one of Arizona's first United Farm Workers offices in our very own downtown in a building that sits off of Boston Street. So we'll kick off the weekend on Friday, March 29th at 9.30 in the morning. There will be an event called the Untold Stories and Cafecito Hour. That's to be held at Light and Life Church, 501 South Arizona Avenue, Friday at 9.30 in the morning. All are welcome. And then we'll be following that on Saturday with an event that is called Community Let's Pull Together. That will be taking place Saturday morning from 7 in the morning to noon. There's a volunteer opportunity from 7 to 8.30 in the morning at our downtown Chandler Community Garden, 190 South Dakota Street. And then we'll be marching over to City Hall at 8.30 in the morning. 
and we'll be there for a program, 8.30 to 11, where we'll hear from a special guest who happens to be the grandson of Cesar Chavez, Andres Chavez, and we're lucky enough to hear from a local legend and community activist, Juanita Encinas, and we'll have some Chandler High students there as well. So I hope to see some folks out there this weekend. And lastly, um, it's time to talk about Operation Back to School, believe it or not. Um, we're in our, entering our last quarter and planning has already been in effect. We just held our second committee meeting for Operation Back to School. So I just wanna give a heads up. We are hosting Operation Back to School this year on July 13th, and it will be again at Compass Christian Church. And in case you're new to Chandler, every summer before the beginning of the school year for our city, Chandler provides thousands, literally thousands of students throughout Chandler with essentials. So backpacks, shoes, we even have haircuts now that are available. And this is pretty much completely volunteer driven. It's a one of a kind operation. I think we're the largest to run something like this in the state. So if you might be interested in sponsoring or contributing to one of the collection drives, please contact Backpack Drive at forourcitychandler.org. Um, there's always events happening, so those are two I wanted to highlight. And I do wanna recognize and thank CUSD community members who make the time to attend watch and engage our board meetings, including local leadership. Uh, council member uh, Bon Giovanni has been mentioned. He's joined us tonight. It's great to know that we have a village that intersects and recognizes that intersection. And of course, our regulars that are here at every school board meeting, you do not go unseen. Thank you for making the time and spending Wednesday nights with us. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Serrano. Mr. Worth. Yes. Um, by the way, I think Jason's analogy was perfect. You have the playground, you have the non-playground, and then administrators got to figure out what to do next, and it's not simple. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Worth. Um, I was just one going thing to. I forgot to mention. I'm sorry, but it's pretty important, and you're going to think it's important too. But we do have this speak up for safety tip line. So people want to get involved, and I encourage people, if you see something, say something, because it gives the district the opportunity to get in front of things. So um, it really helped the community to be part of the solution along with us, but we can't do anything about things we don't know about. Correct. So let us know. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Rose, you're absolutely correct. We can't do anything uh, with for things that we don't know anything about. And, and to be able to report these um, um, is quite important. Um, on a different note, um, I, was in, I went to the Chandler Education Foundation uh, board meeting this, this week, and um, they completed their car raffle and raised um, a significant amount of money for student scholarships for students in the Chandler Unified School District. Um, they are starting the process of, uh, well, they're in the middle of taking applications now for not only the impact scholarships, but by for donor scholarships also. Um, and they will be awarding those scholarships um, uh, later on in uh, April. Um, additionally, some of their, their funding, they, they get, uh, they have several revenue streams, and one of them also is um, for our teachers um, to help them with their lifelong learning, uh, getting various certifications. And um, it sounds like they are going to be uh, increasing the amount that they will be allowing for um, lifelong learning um, uh, grants for teachers. Um, additionally, the cash for classrooms uh, looks like they're going to be um, raising that limit for the amount of money that is, uh, teachers can can request uh, for their classrooms um, for next year. So a lot of good, really good things happening uh, with the Chandler Education Foundation and um, uh, how they really help our teachers and our students and uh, the classrooms. So uh, I guess that's about it. Oh, and um, just if you do have any um, high school seniors, uh, the deadlines for applying for the scholarships are, is coming up pretty quick. I think it's April 7th, is it? Leo, is that correct? 
April 8th, April 7th, something like that. Um, uh, that's the deadline for applying for a lot of, uh, for all of the scholarships for the, uh, that are uh, awarded by the Chandler Education Foundation. So uh, make sure that any seniors that you know or have that want are interested in applying for those, get those um, in right away. So uh, I think that's it. And uh, this meeting is adjourned. We'll see you next time. <laughs>